January 5th, 2023. I want to welcome everybody back to the Opinionated Idiot YouTube channel. And wow, what a day. What a very interesting day in the case against Ryan Koberger in connection with the mur murder of the four University Idaho Moscow students. And I've read through the affidavit uh, quite a bit. It's um, lots of information to go through. And what I want to do this evening is pull up the affidavit. I'm going to try to read as much as I can. Keep in mind, I stutter. <laughs> I pronounce words wrong. Um, but hopefully we can get through this evening. And then uh, I have a probably an easier breakdown of just some notes that I went through uh, in the affidavit a timeline. And I want to kind of go through that as well. And then maybe some questions at the end. And I may open the phone lines tonight. Have you guys call in if you guys want to uh, call in. So let's do this. I'm going to pull up the affidavit. Let's go through that. Uh, before we do that, we know that Brian was in a uh, Leda uh, County courtroom this, uh, this afternoon or early this morning uh, to be his first hearing. Uh, the affidavit was released just after that. And the next hearing for Brian will be on January, January 12th. So let's pull up this affidavit and start to read through. <clears throat> okay. Um, something I want to quickly just take note of that there's been some conversation about the redacted information here on page two. And you can see that the, the page has been flipped. And, and what I'm going to probably assume is that this is where it starts to get into injuries. Uh, and they probably wanted to hide because of the brutalness of the injury. And you got to keep in mind this, an affidavit, what this basically is, is to bring forth evidence in uh to, to a judge to base the connection to someone in a crime so you're not going to have every single little detail like you would here in a trial uh, but this is very informative this is very in-depth it's one of the most in-depth affidavit that i ever read and they really wanted to tie brian uh, to this crime. So again, bear with me this evening. I'm going to try to read through. There's a lot of information here. Try to get through as much as I can. Again, I am a stutterer. Uh, I don't pronounce things well. Uh, English <laughs> is my first language, but I'm awful uh, at, re at reading and going through things. But we'll, uh, we'll try to get through that here. So um, so statement from Brett Payne. This is Exhibit A. It says the below information is provided by Brett Payne, uh, who is a duly appointed qualified and acting peace officer within the county of uh, Ledo State in uh, state of Idaho. Brett Payne is employed by Moscow Police Department in the official capacity of position of Corporal CPL and has been trained and qualified peace officer for approximately four years. CPL Payne uh, has been assisted by members of the Ohio State Police and agents of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. On November 13, 2022, at approximately 4 p.m., Moscow Police Department uh, Sergeant Blaker and I responded to 1122 King Road, Moscow, Idaho, hereafter, hereafter the King Road residence to assist with scene security and proceeding of a crime processing a crime scene associated with four homicides upon the arrival the ohio state police isp forensic team was on scene and was preparing to begin processing the scene sorry my nose is very itchy right now <laughs> uh moving on mp mpd officer uh ofc smith was one of the initial response officers to the incident advising he would walk me through the scene so this shows that there were officers, obviously there's responding officers that have been there. They probably walk through, do a quick in and get out. We need to wait for forensics to get here. They see, seal off the crime scene 
and forensics will come in and do their work. OFC Smith and I entered the King Road residence through the bottom door on the north side of the building. OFC Smith and I walked upstairs to the second floor. OFC Smith directed me down the hallway to the west bedroom of the second floor, which I later learned through Xana's driver's license and other personal belongings found in the room was Xana Canodal's uh, room, basically her room. Just before this, there was uh, just before this, just before this room, there was a bathroom door on the south wall of the hallway. As I approached the room, and I, I'm going to say here tonight, there's going to be some things that that uh, may be shocking for some people, some some strong language in this. Um, but I just want to throw that warning out there. So it says, as I approached the room, I could see a body later identified as Canodal's laying on the floor. Canodal was deceased with wounds which appeared to have been caused by a edged weapon. Also in the room was a male, later identified as Ethan Chapin. Chapin, who was also deceased with wounds, later determined. Ops every, ops, autopsy report provided by Spokane. And here's the redacted page. I'm probably going to say in this page here, it was just the, the brutalness of the nature of the wounds. So they probably um, sealed that off and redacted the information. Spokane County Medical Examiner dated, uh, they kind of obviously blanked out the name of the, the person that did the examination, dated um, December 15, 2022, to be caused by sharp force injuries. And that probably had some connection as to what was on the second page. So you have... Um, you have edged an edged weapon wounds, and you have um, sharp forced injuries. I then followed OFC Smith upstairs to the third floor of the residence. The third floor consisted of two bedrooms and one bathroom. The bedroom on the west side of the floor was later determined to be Kaylee uh, Kaylee's room. I later then learned. Uh, I later I later learned there was a dog in the room when Moscow police officers initially responded. The dog belonged to Kaylee and her ex-boyfriend, Jack. I found out from my interview that Jack, on November 13, 2022, that he and Kaylee shared the dog. OFC Smith then pointed out a small bathroom on the east side of the third floor. This bathroom shared a wall with Madison, uh, Madison's bedroom, which was situated on the southwest corner of the third floor. So what this is now doing is kind of giving you a map to where everybody was situated, where everybody's rooms were in the house. <clears throat> As I entered the bedroom, I could see two females in the single bed, uh, in the single bed in a room. Both Conglavas and Mogan were deceased with visible stab wounds. I also later noted that uh, it appeared to be a tan. I all and this is very important. I also I also later noticed what appeared to be a tan leather sheath laying on the bed next to Mogan's right side. The sheath was later processed and had a K bar U.S. MC, which would be U.S. Marine Corps, uh, and the U.S. Marine Corps Eagle Globe and anchored insignia stamped on the outside of it. The Ohio State Lab later indicated located a single source of male DNA suspect's profile, meaning Brian Kohlberger's profile, left on the on the button snap of the, sh the knife knife sheath. Blah, blah. I'll get through this, I promise. And if you guys don't know what a K bar knife is, uh, let me just pull up a quick photo of that so you can see what that type of knife is and what they're talking about in this affidavit. So this is a K bar style knife. It would be something similar to this, has a very sharp edge, uh, very simple Marine Corps style knife, combat knife, um, but that just gives you an idea of what that weapon would look like. I want to welcome everybody into the stream this evening. Thank you so much for jumping over here with me. I'm going to try to read through the uh, affidavit that was released today in Brian Koberger's sentencing, or not sentencing, his hearing, and they unsealed the affidavit. So let's keep moving on here. Um, as part of the investigation, numerous interviews were conducted by Moscow Police Department officers, Idaho State Police detectives, and FBI agents. 
Two of the interviews included uh, BF and DM. Both uh, BF and DM were inside the King Road residence at the time of the homicides and were roommates of the victims. BF's bedroom was located on the east side of the first floor of the King residence. Excuse me one second. Based on numerous interviews conducted by M. PD officers, ISP detectives, and FBI agents, as well as my review of the evidence, I have learned the following. And now this is going to start laying out the timeline as to what happened. And it's it's pretty interesting that a lot of this, you know, what we heard in the media, what we could put together as to where the specific suspect was, because we didn't know at the time that it was uh, Brian Coburg was the suspect or is the suspect or the alleged suspect. Um, that a lot of the information that was provided, the timeline was pretty well, well on. Uh, and I don't know if that was done by purpose, that was leaked out by purpose uh, to try to really pinpoint uh, times and uh, who this person potentially could be. But you're going to find out they had a lot of evidence, well, circumstantial evidence around the specific time uh, when this all happened. Uh, so on the evening of November 12, 2022, Chapman and Canoodle was seen by BF at the Sigma Chi House of the University of Idaho campus um, from approximately 9 p.m. on November 12th, 1.45 a.m. Uh, let me just get to this chat really quick. Saw that pop up. Thank you, Hillbilly Island Life. He says, I think Big Bri will eventually take a plea and give it up and write a book about all of his kills. Yeah, that may possibly be. And it's funny that you're saying right now about meaning it ain't his first rodeo. I actually did a video on this. You can watch it on my channel. Uh, I believe the title is I Was Correct About the Moscow Murder or I Was Correct About Brian Canodal. Uh, I believe, and it's under my estimation, that this is not his first rodeo. He has done this before. This is type of uh, of uh, thrill killing for him. And uh, I think you're you're 100 right on to say that this possibly could not be his first his first rodeo. Um, I, I did actually, like I said, made a video about that and talked about that. Um, so let's keep moving on here because we have a lot to go through. I'm going to try to do my best to read through this. Um, and again, I apologize. I'm a stutterer. I, I cannot pronounce it very well uh, because of my stutter, but we'll try to get through this as best as I can. Uh, where were we? Okay. So, uh, where did I leave? All right. Kay uh, Kaylee and uh, Maddie were at the local bar at the corner club at uh, 202 North Street, Maine in Moscow. Uh, Kaylee and Maddie can be seen on video footage provided by the Corner Club Club Bar uh, between 10 p.m. on November 12th and 1.30 a.m. Uh, on November 13th. At approximately 1.30 a.m., Kaylee and Maddie can be seen on video at the local food vendor called the Grub Truck uh, in downtown Moscow. The Grub Truck live streams video from their food, food truck on a streaming platform, Twitch, which is available for public viewing on their website. The video is captured by law enforcement, a private party, and it's been, looks like it's been redacted there, reported that he provided a ride to uh, Kaylee and Maddie at approximately 1.56 uh, a.m. from downtown Moscow in front of the King Road residence. And I'm just gonna pull this chat up as well. Uh, Hillbilly Island, thank you so much for chatting. He says, I also believe he wasn't sure when he dropped the sheath until today. That's quite possible. Um, that is quite possible. And I think that's one of the main reasons why I think that he skipped his uh, extra and wanted to be extradited back to Ohio because he wanted to see this affidavit, what he was going to be up against so he could work with his defense attorney to you know, conjure up or, or come up with some type of defense as to why. And a little later here, I'm going to pull up, uh, I have a... a, a uh, timeline versus Brian and everybody in the house. We're going to go through that. I'm going to talk about the circumstantial evidence, the physical evidence, and then some of my final thoughts as well. So I'm prepared for a long live stream this evening. I know that you probably all can't stay with me uh, through the whole thing, but um, 
you know, we'll get through it. And if, if you can't stay through the whole thing, you can always go back and watch uh, during the, uh, the replay. You can always go back and replay it. So, um, but thank you. Thank you so much for chatting. I really do appreciate it. Make sure, guys, please upvote this stream because it does help to get this gets my channel out into the algorithm. And again, if this is your first time over here kind of hanging out, a little bit about me really quick. Uh, I am not new to YouTube. I've had another channel for about a year and a half. That channel kind of died out and uh, didn't, does not really get that much traction. And I've wanted to move on from it for a while. That's why I started this brand new channel. But I really appreciate everybody's interaction on this channel the last, I've only had it up maybe a week now, and it's just been going really well. So ultimately I want to get this channel out there, pushed into the algorithm. Um, I want to get uh, monetized and start making some really fabulous content. And of course, I'm going to follow the story all the way to the end because I think things are just very, very interesting. And as we're finding out, there's been a lot of stuff uh, that that we're, we're hearing here. So uh, again, let's move on here in the affidavit. So DM and BF both made statements during the interviews that indicated that the occupants of King Road were home by 2 a.m. and they slept and they were asleep or at least in their rooms by approximately 4 a.m. This is this is with the exception of uh, Zana, who received a DoorDash order at the residence at approximately 4 a.m. Law enforcement identified the DoorDash delivery driver who reported this information. And I believe that um, they probably obviously have been, uh, you know, cleared of all wrongdoing in this case. And this is now where it gets really uh, interesting in this uh, this affidavit. So DM stated she originally went to sleep in her bedroom on the south side of the second floor. DM stated she was awoken at approximately 4 a.m. by what she had stated like sounded like Kaylee playing with her dog in one of the upstairs bedrooms, which were located on the third floor. A short, a short time later, DM said she heard she heard who she thought was Kaylee saying something to the effect of there's someone here. A review of the record obtained from forensic download of Zana's phone showed this could have been Zana as her cell, cell, cell phone indicated that she was likely awake in using a TikTok app at approximately 4.12 a.m. And I wanted to just pull up this chat too. Hillbilly is chatting again. He's saying, I wonder if DM got a good enough look at him to ID him in a photo lineup before his arrest. So DM gave a clear description. She saw Brian in that dark hallway. And I believe it says in the affidavit that he either walked past her or near her as she kind of peeked out her door. That leads me to believe a couple of things. And I'm going to talk a little bit later in the stream, but we'll bring it up now because it's a, it's a good point. Um, that leads me to believe she had, she gave a clear description of Brian. Um, and this leads me to believe either because this crime, these crimes were so quick. I mean, Brian literally had between 13 and 15 minutes to kill four people. You have to get it. He had to get in, commit the crime, and get out as quick as possible. So you have all that adrenaline flowing. So one of two things, he was just basically tired at that point, wanted to get out as quick as possible, or maybe, and this is just my opinion, that he wanted to maybe leave DM alive to kind of pin everything on them uh, in the house, or he just probably didn't see her and he left. So that's that's been some speculation that's come up as well. Okay, so let's uh, continue. But but great point, great point. Um, let's continue to move on. It says, and right here now we're getting kind of into this part. It says DM stated she looked out of her bedroom and she didn't see anything when she heard the comment about someone being in the house. And let me just go back up to this chat. He said, could have had blood in his eyes too. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a great point. Uh, DMs stated that she looked out of her bedroom and did not see anything when she heard the comment about someone being in the house. DM stated she opened her door the second time when she heard what she thought was crying coming from Xana's room. DM then said, 
she heard a male voice say something to the effect of, it's okay, I'm going to help you. Oh man, this is chilling. At approximately 4.17 a.m., a security camera located at 11, 1112 King Road, a residence immediately to the northwest of 1122 King Road picked up a distorted audio of what sounded like voices or a whimpering followed by a loud thud. A dog can also be heard barking numerous times starting at 4.17 a.m. The security camera is less than 50 feet from the west wall of Xana's bedroom. And Hillbilly, I'm going to help you, meaning please be quiet while I finish you off. Spooky. Yeah, absolutely. That's, uh, yeah, I mean, either that or maybe um, it was Ethan. You know, maybe Ethan was hurt or, compa you know, he was obviously hurt. Maybe he crawled over to Xana and was like, you know, I'm going to help you. Don't worry. And then he couldn't get help because obviously he was injured uh, too much. Uh, but this definitely is sounds more like Brian said something to her. Who anyway, um, let's move along here. DM stated she opened the door for the third time. So she looked out once she looked out twice and now a third time after after she heard the crying and saw a figure in clad clad in black clothing and a mask that covered the person's mouth and nose walking towards DM, described the figure as 5'10 or taller, male, not muscular, but athletically built with brushy, bushy eyebrows, which is almost a clear description of BK. The male walked past DM as she stood in a frozen shock phase, the male walked towards the backsliding glass door. DM locked herself in her room after seeing the male. DM did not state that she recognized the male. This leads investigators to believe that the murderer left the scene. And Brian is saying, I have one big question. Who's who was killed first? Seems like Kaylee and Maddie on the third floor. This is creepy and is going to spill the beans like Israel Keys did. Yeah, this, I don't know. And that's probably, you know, that'll come up in trial who they think was killed first um, because you can obviously um, get time of death uh, from a body. You know, the medical examiner would make a, a um, you know, a, a, an estimated time of death. But I think it was it was Kaylee and Maddie first, um, and then and then Zana and uh, Ethan. So, all right, let's keep moving on here. Uh, let me just get a quick sip of water. And it says the combination of DM statement to law enforcement reviews of forensic downloads of records from BF and DM's phone in video of suspect video as described below leads investigators to believe the homicides occurred occur, or bleh, occurred between 4 a.m. and 4.25 a.m. During the processing of the crime scene, investigators found a late, a, a late Latin, Latin shoe print. This was located during the the second processing of the crime scene by ISP forensic team by first using presumptive blood test and amino black, a protein stain that detects the presence of cellular material. The detected shoe print showed a diamond shaped pattern similar to pattern of a Vans type sole just outside the door of DM's bedroom located on the second floor. This is consistent with DM's statement regarding the suspect's path of travel. Wow, this is chilling. As part of the investigation, an extensive search commonly referred to in law enforcement as video canvas was conducted in the area of King Road residence. This video canvas was obtained by footage from the early morning hours of November 13, 2022 in the area of King Road residence in surrounding neighborhoods in effort to locate the suspect or suspect's vehicle 
traveling or leaving the King Road residence. This video canvas has resulted in collection of numerous surveillance, surveillance videos in the area from both residents and business addresses. I have reviewed numerous videos that were collected and I had conversations with the other MPD officers, ISP detectives and FBI agents that are similarly reviewing footage as it was obtained. A review of camera footage indicated a white sedan hereafter suspect vehicle one was observed traveling westbound in the 700 block of Indian Hills Drive in Moscow at approximately 3.26 a.m. and westbound on Steiner Avenue at Idaho State Highway 95 in Moscow at approximately 3.28 a.m. So what this is doing now is backing up and showing when BK's car was leaving and traveling to the King Road residence. On this video, it appeared suspect vehicle one was not displaying a front license plate. A review of footage from multiple videos obtained from King Road, King Road neighborhood showed multiple sightings of suspect vehicle one starting at 3.29 a.m. and ending at 4.20 a.m. So we know he was definitely in that area between that time. These sightings showed suspect vehicle one makes an initial three passes by 1122 King Road residents and then leave via Walnetta Dr well, well, Drive. Based off my experience as a patrol officer, this is a residential neighborhood with very limited number of vehicles that travel in the area during the early morning hours. Upon review of the video, there are a few cars that enter and exit the area during this time frame. So this just makes you wonder and think. He circled in that area three times. And this is the biggest thing in this case that we don't know yet. What is his connection or what is his motive to this house, to these four individuals? That is the big question why. And that's something that they're going to have to find out when this goes to trial because we don't know yet. And we know another thing too, there's no murder weapon. Murder weapon hasn't been found. Okay. Suspect vehicle one can be seen entering the area a fourth time. He went four times. Approximately 4.04 a.m., it can be seen driving eastbound on King Road, stopping and turning around in front of 500 Queen Road, number 52, and then driving back westbound on King Road. When suspect vehicle one is in front of the King Road residence, it appears to unsuccessfully attempt to park or turn around in the road. The vehicle can continue to an intersection of Queen Road and King Road where it can be seen completing a three-point turn and then driving eastbound again on Queen, down Queen Road. Suspect Vehicle 1 is next seen departing the area of King Road residence at approximately 4.20 a.m. at a high rate of speed. Suspect Vehicle 1 is next observed traveling southbound on Wal Walnetta Drive. Based on my knowledge of the area, the review of the camera footage in that near neighborhood. It does not show SV1 during the time frame. I believe that SV1 likely exited the neighborhood at Paulus River Drive and Canesta Drive. Paulus River Drive is at the south edge of Moscow and proceeds into Whitman County, Washington. Eventually, the road leads to Pullman, Washington. Pullman, Washington is approximately 10 miles from Moscow, Idaho. Both Pullman and Moscow are small college towns, and people commonly travel back and forth in between them. So they're trying to make that connection. They're trying to show you how close, because we know Brian was in Pullman, and they want to show how close Moscow and Pullman are to each other. I'm just going to take a quick breather break here. <laughs> All right. 
take a little pause. Let's move along here. I get, gave my, my voice a little rest. Only eight more pages to read. <laughs> I appreciate everybody hanging out, though. I definitely wanted to uh, to read through this evening with you guys. So law enforcement officers provided video footage of SV-1 to forensic examiners with the FBI that regularly utilizes surveillance footage to identify a year, make and model of unknown vehicle that is observed by one or more cameras during the commission of a criminal offense. The forensic examiner has approximately 35 years of law enforcement experience with 12 years of FBI in 12 years with the FBI. He specifically training includes identifying new characteristics of vehicles and he uses database that gives visual clues of vehicles across state to identify differences between vehicles. All right. After reviewing numerous observations of SV1, the forensic examiner initially believed that SV1 was a 2011 to 2013 Hyundai Elantra. And we heard obviously a lot about that over these past few weeks or multiple weeks. As a result, investigators have been reviewing information on persons in possession of a vehicle that is a 2011 to 2016 white Hyundai Elantra. Investigators were given, and I'll tell you, this is one of the most detailed affidavits I have ever read through super detailed uh investigators were given access to video footage on washington state university campus located in pullman washington a review of the video indicated that at approximately 2 44 a.m on november 13 2022 a white sedan which was consistent with the description of the white elantra known as sv1 was observed on wsu surveillance cameras traveling north on southeast nevada street in North Stadium Way. So now we're we're placing BK in Pullman at the university and leaving. At approximately 2.53 a.m., a white sedan was consistent with the description of a white Elantra known as SV1 was observed traveling north southeast on uh, Nevada Street in Pullman, Washington towards S SR70. SR70 connects Pullman, Washington, Moscow, Idaho, this camera footage from Pullman, Washington was provided to the same FBI ex forensic examiner. Forensic examiner identified the vehicle observed in Pullman, Washington as being a 2014 to 2016 Hyundai Elantra. I'm just going to get a sip of water here really quick. Excuse me one second. <clears throat> All right. All right. Moving on. Page nine. At approximately 525 a.m., a white sedan, which is consistent with the description of S SV1, was observed on five cameras in Pullman, Washington, and on a WSU campus cameras. The first camera that recorded the white sedan was located at 1300 Johnson Road in Pullman. A white sedan was observed traveling northbound on Johnson Road. Johnson Road leads back to West Palos River Drive in Moscow, which intersects with uh, Kinesi, uh Drive. And white. the white sedan was, was then observed turning north on Bishop Boulevard and northwest on SR270. At approximately 5.27 a.m., the white launch was observed on cameras traveling northbound on Stadium Way. Uh, in Grimes, the Kuga Way, description showing Moscow and Pullman. So we got a little bit of a picture there, description known white launch or path traveling not to scale. Uh, I'm going to move through this stuff here. Okay. On November 25th, 2022, MPD asked area law enforcement agents to be on the lookout for a white Hyundai Elantra in that area on November 29th, 2022 at approximately 11.28 a.m. Uh, WSU police officer Daniel uh, Tiango. Um, let's see. Qu uh, queried a white Elantras registered at WSU. As a result of that query, he located a 2015 white Elantra in a pen with Pennsylvania license plate uh, LFZ 
8649. This vehicle is registered to Brian Koberger, uh, residing at 1630 North East Valley Road, apartment 201 Pullman, Washington. Uh, Valley Road is approximately three quarters of a mile from the intersection of Stadium Way and Cougar Way. This is so detailed. This affidavit is so detailed. The same day at approximately 12.58 a.m., WSU officer Curtis Whiteman was looking for a white Hyundai Elantra and located a 2015 Hyundai Elantra at 1630 Northeast Valley Road in Pullman in a parking lot. 1630 Northeast Valley Road is an apartment complex that houses WSU students. Officer Whiteman also ran the car and it returned to Kohlberger with a Washington tag. They knew who this guy was. They had this potential suspect right away within like a week they had it they had him in a week i review Koberger's washington state driver's license information and photograph the license indicates that Koberger was a white male of height of six feet and weighs about 185 pounds additionally the photograph of Koberger shows that he was he has bushy eyebrows Koberger's physical description is consistent with the description of the male dm saw inside the king road residence on november 13th Further investigation includes a review of Lathith County Sheriff's Department CPL Duke's body cam and report showed on August 21st, 2022, Brian Colbert was detained as part of a traffic stop that occurred in Moscow, Idaho. At the time, Koberger, who was a sole occupant, was driving a white 2015 Hyundai Elantra with Pennsylvania plate, which was set to expire on November 30, 2022. During the stop, which he was which was recorded via the law enforcement Karen Koberger provided his phone number as you know, it's been redacted, obviously here after the 485 phone as his cellular telephone number investigated, conducted electronic database queries and learned that the 845 phone is a number that's issued by AT&T. Excuse me. I am yawning. On October 14, 2022, Koberger was detained as part of the traffic stop by a WSU police officer. God, this guy has been in so much contact with officers. It's crazy. On October 14, Brian Cobra was detained as part of a traffic stop by WSU police officer. Upon review of that body cam report of the stop, Cobra was the sole occupant driving the uh, white Elantra Pennsylvania plate. On November 18th, 22, according to Washington State Licensing, Coburger registered a 2015 Elantra with, with Washington and later received a Washington plate. Prior to this time, the 2015 white Elantra was registered in Pennsylvania, which does not require front license, front license plate to be displayed. This was learned through communication with the Pennsylvania officer who was currently certified in state of Pennsylvania. Based on my own experience, in communication with Washington law enforcement, I know that Idaho and Washington require front and back license plates to be displayed. All right. Everybody still hanging in? <laughs> All right. Investigators believe that Kohlberger is still driving the 2015 white Elantra because his vehicle was captured on De December 13, 2022 by a license plate reader in Loma, Colorado, information provided by Quarry to a database. Kohlberger's Elantra was then quarried on 2015-2022 by law enforcement in Hancock, Indiana. On December 16th, 2022, at approximately 2.26 p.m., surveillance video showed Kohlberger's white Elantra in Allsbright, Pennsylvania. The sole occupant of the vehicle was a white male whose description was consistent with Kohlberger. Kohlberger has family in Albright's, Pennsylvania. Based on information provided by WSU website, Kohlberger has a current, currently, this is so in depth, is currently a PhD student in criminology at Washington State University, persistent to records provided by the member of of the interview panel for Pullman's police department. We learned that Kohlberger's past education included undergraduate degrees in psychology and cloud-based forensics. 
These records also show Kohlberger wrote an essay when he applied for the internship with the Pullman Police Department in the fall of 2022. Kohlberger wrote his essay. Uh, he had interest in assisting rural law enforcement agencies on how to better collect and analysis technical data, oh my God, in public safety operations. Koberger also posted a Reddit survey, which can be found by open source internet search. The survey asked for participants to provide information to, quote, understand how emotions and psychological traits influence decision making when committing a crime. This is deep, man. Wow. As part of this investigation, law enforcement obtained search warrants to determine cellular devices that ut utilize cell towers in proximity of the King Road residence on November 13, 2022, between 3 a.m. and 5 a.m. After determining that Kohlberger was associated to both the 2015 White Elantra and the 845 phone, investigators reviewed these search warrant returns. A quarry of 845 phone and these returns did not show the 845 phone utilizing cell towers resources in close proximity to King Road residence between 3 a.m. and 5 a.m. Based on my training experience and conversations with law enforcement officers that specialize in utilization of cell phone tower records as part of investigation, individuals can either leave their cellular telephone at a different location before committing a crime or turn their cellular phone off prior to location before committing a crime. This is done to subjects in the effort to avoid alerting law enforcement that a cellular device associated with them was in a particular area where a crime was committed or is committed. I also know that on numerous occasions, subjects will surveil an area where they intend to commit a crime prior to the day of the crime. Depending on the circumstances, this can be done in a few days before several months prior to the commission of the crime. During these types of surveillance, it's possible that individuals uh, would not leave their cell phone at a specific location or turn it off since they do not plan to commit offenses on that particular day. On December 23rd, 2022, I applied, I applied for and was granted a search warrant for historical phone records between November 12th and November 14th for the A5 for BK's phone held by the uh, phone provider AT&T on December 23rd. Uh, on December 23rd, uh, persistent to that search warrant, I received records for 8458 phone from AT&T. These records indicated that the 845 phone is sub subject, is subscribed to Brian Koberger as an address as Albright's Pennsylvania and the account had been open since June 23rd of 22. These records also include historical cell site location for the 845, 8458 phone. After receiving this information, I consulted with the FBI special agent that is certified as a member of uh, CAST, CAST. Uh, members of CAST are certified with FBI to provide expert testimony in the field of historical CS. LI and are required to pass extensive training. This is so detailed. It's incredibly detailed. Wow. Required to pass extensive training that includes both written and practical examinations prior to, to be certified with CAST as well as completion of yearly certification requirements. I read through this, but I didn't go like super detailed. I just kind of scanned over and read timelines, but this is so detailed crazy the amount of detail in here like i said it's like one of the most detailed affidavits i've ever read through my voice is holding up so uh i'm gonna try to get through the rest of this here all right um on november 13 2022 at approximately 2 42 a.m the a45 phone was utilizing utilizing cell cell resources that provided coverage to 1630 northwest valley road uh, Pullman, Washington, the Coburger residence at approximately 2.47 a.m., the 845 phone. Unit. So now what they're basically doing is showing where the areas that Brian's phone was along this timeline. And it's going to start pinging 
all of the cell towers along those locations. Um, I'm probably not going to read through this. I mean, I think you guys get the general idea of what's going on here. They're basically just matching up his cell data with uh, the the uh, the camera footage that was found kind of lining up where Brian was in all of those areas. So let's keep going here. Um, all right, this is cellular sites, and this is the route that he took. Um, let's see. Okay, so let's get here. It says, based on my training experience and facts of the investigation thus far, I believe that Koberger was the user of the 845 phone, was likely the driver of the white Elantra and observed departing Pullman, Washington. And that is the vehicle that I likely SV1. Additionally, the route of travel of the 8458 phone during the early morning hours of November 13, 2022, and the lack of the 845 phone reporting to the at t between 247 and 448 is consistent with Coburg's attempt to conceal his location during the quadruple homicide that occurred at the King Road residence. residence, residence. Okay. Uh, so it goes on to say that looks like he tried to get another historical some more historical documents to uh, and a pen registration trap and trace in efforts to uh, determine if Koberger stalked any of the victims in the case prior to the offense, conducted surveillance on King Road residents, uh, was in contact with any of the victims associated before or after the alleged offense in any locations that may contain evidence of the murders that occurred on November 13, 2022 in the location of the White Elantra Res to Koberger as well as the location of Koberger. Um, let's see. Looks like he's estimate locations from June to presence, the time period authorized by the court. Uh, goes on to say, all these occasions except for the one occurred in late evening or early morning hours of their respective days. So this is kind of showing that he was in and around those areas of the home. On one of these occasions, on August 21st, cell phone resources providing coverage to King Road Revs at approximately 10, 1034 p.m. and 1135 p.m. at approximately 1137, Koberger was stopped by Leith County Sheriff Department, CPL Duke, as mentioned above. So he's been pinged in that area as well in August and we found out about that earlier um it's just kind of matching up more cell phone data the areas that he was in uh let's see more cell phone data being pinged this is looks like a, a map of particular areas and all the areas that his cell phone was hitting off of uh let's see all right let's get to the end here this is a lot of cell phone data so i just didn't want to to read that uh so anyway really quick it says additional analysis of the records of 845 phone indicated between approximately 520 versus coverage of the johnson idaho that is consistent with the 845 phone being in the area of the 845 phone traveled in the hours immediately following the suspicious time of the homicides occurred okay this is going to get to the end here on november on December, November, on December 27, 2022, Pennsylvania agents recovered the trash from Koberger's family residence located in Allsbright, Pennsylvania. That evidence was sent to an Ohio State lab for testing. On December 28, 2022, the Ohio State lab reported that a DNA profile obtained from the trash and the DNA profile obtained from the sheath. This is the sheath that was dropped at the scene. Identified a male as not being excluded as the biological father of suspect profile, meaning Brian Koberger, at at least 99.9998% of the male population would be expected to be excluded from the possibility of being a suspect's biological father. Wow. 
Based on the above information, I am requesting an arrest warrant to be issued for Brian C. Koberger, date of birth, 11-21-1994, and that's creepy. He had a birthday. Wow. Uh, for burglary at 1122 King Street in Moscow, Idaho, in four counts of murder in the first degree for the murders of Madison, Cayley, Zana, and Ethan, I declare under penalty and perjury, persistent to the law of the state of Idaho, that foregoing is true and correct. And this is the signed affidavit. So I want to reflect here. I have kind of my own notes and timeline that I that I did. And like I said, it's a very powerful affidavit. There is a ton of information in it, so detailed um, that I, it's one of the most detailed affidavits I have ever read in my entire life. <clears throat> I'm just going to take a sip of water here, and then I want to pull up my notes and go through that and just find this timeline uh, very, very interesting. Okay, let's pull up my notes. Okay, let's do this. All right. So here's some notes that I made. And just really quick, let me just answer this. Okay. Okay. All right, let's uh, let's go through this. So I made some notes here as to circumstantial evidence in this case. So I, what I did was I kind of side by side Kaylee and Maddie and Brian's movements and then Zana's movements. Uh, the the students will be highlighted in yellow. And then Brian, you see the, you know, the indication of BK. I'm going to start at 2 a.m. because that's really when this all starts to kind of unfold. Um, so you have Kaylee and Maddie that return to the home at King Road at 2 a.m. Brian, between 2.47 and 2.53 a.m., switches his phone off and leaves Pullman heading towards SR270. And this is collaborated by the video and the phone evidence that we just read in the affidavit. Um, BK Brian at 2.26 and to 2.28 a.m., Brian's car is seen approximately 39 minutes later on the 700 block of the Indian Hills Drive and Steiner Avenue uh, at Ohio State Highway 95 near the victim's home. Brian then at 3.29 and 4.20 a.m., there are multiple sightings of Brian's car in the King Road neighborhood. These include, all right, so now here's where the timeline starts. At 3.29 to approximately 4.04, he drove by the victim's house, it was four times. You have Zana that receives her door dash at 4 a.m., at 4 a.m., something wakes up DM. That's one of the surviving roommates. She says she thought KG was playing with her dog upstairs, Kaylee. Zana at 4.12 a.m. is still awake using TikTok. That's been confirmed, and we read that in the affidavit. Kaylee... Uh, at 4.17 a.m., uh, King Road, I'm sorry. King Road residence at 4.17 a.m. A security camera picks up voices and whimpering and then a loud thud. I'm just going to move this down here. DM, the surviving roommate, between 4.17 and 4.20 a.m., opens the door and sees the male clad in black. The male walks past DM as she freezes. Male leaves through slider. DM locks herself in her room. Brian, between 4.20 and 4.25 a.m., uh, is seen departing at a high rate of speed and leaving southbound on Wilnetta Drive. At 4.20, between 4.48, uh, 
law enforcement believes Brian immediately exited via uh, Pelos River Drive and uh, Consigna Drive and takes Highway 95 towards Blaine, Idaho. Cell phone and cell phone is switched on near Blaine at 4.48 a.m. Uh, at 4.50, between 4.50 and 5.26 a.m., travels to Genesa, Genesa, Idaho, and then to Uniontown, Idaho, and then back to Pullman based on cell records. BK uh, at 5.26 a.m. returns to Pullman, corroborated by his cell records and video evidence. Then, this is crazy. At 9 a.m. to 9.32 a.m., B Brian leaves Pullman and returns to Moscow before returning to Pullman. He departs Pullman at 9, between 9.12 and 9.21 in Moscow near the area of the crime. He went to the area of the crime at the next day at 9.21. BK then returns to Pullman at 9.32. So that is the timeline. That's, that's your circumstantial evidence. Now we're going to look at the physical evidence. And this is things that just are crazy. So there's not much physical evidence that they reference in the affidavit. And there's a few things that I found and I found interesting. BK's Brian's DNA found on left bottom snap of the US USMC car bar knife sheath found at the crime scene. The Vans type shoe print outside DM's door, uh, unclear if they had been able to match this to Brian but it's very consistent with her path uh, that she described the path that the suspect left in the physical description uh, DM, the roommate witnessed and ma amassed athletic built figure generally matching the description of BK bushy eyebrows, at least five, 10 approached uh, approached and then left the residence through the sliding door. The huge, <laughs> the smoking gun, literally in this case right now is that sheath if that sheath sheath was never found this probably would have taken years to figure out what happened because there's not much physical evidence at the scene and i am just blown away by that i'm blown away that there is no there's with the brutalness and the nature of these crimes there's no physical evidence. I mean, you would think there'd be more physical evidence at this crime scene. Wow. All right, so I have some thoughts here that I wrote down. As we sit right now, there's still no murder weapon and there's no motive. What is the connection? That's, that's like the million dollar question right now. We know in the affidavit, the movements of that night, what happened during that night, but we still don't know the connection to why Brian went to this house. He obviously, it looks to me that he knew something or knew someone there. He circled the house that night quite a few times. Was this a stalking thing? Did he know them before? The lack of physical evidence is surprising. You know, with how violent this crime scene was, obviously they redacted uh, the information in the affidavit, but we're going to hear about it at trial. We're going to hear how how violent this uh, this crime scene was. There's lots of circumstantial evidence that support Brian is the accused. If And again, I just touched on this, that sheaf was not left at the crime scene. I believe this would have taken years to solve, definitely taken years to solve. Law enforcement knew that Elantra belonged to Brian on 1129, but law enforcement asked the public for help around 7127. Looks like they put out that in the press to get in a press release to get Brian to make a move. It's kind of like playing chess. I think it was a very smart decision on Moscow police to keep kind of putting that out there. We're looking for this white Elantra. We're looking for this white Elantra. And ultimately it did actually make him make a move to move. And uh, they were able to follow him, kind of flush out the uh, flush out the suspect. It's very smart. Another question that's come up is why has Brian, why did Brian's dad drive back with Brian? So now um, there's been a lot of speculation out there. You know, was Brian's dad is saying that it was a, a planned trip? 
And what I want to know is where uh, apparently it was a planned trip. He was supposed to fly out to Washington, meet with Brian for the holidays and drive back to Pennsylvania to spend the holidays together. And then Brian would drive back to Washington. What I want to see is, was his plane tickets bought previous, like months before all this happened? Or was it right in and around when all this happened? And that would kind of lead you to think, you know, did Brian tell something to his dad? Was he, you know, that's a long car trip. It's a long car trip from Washington to Pennsylvania. You know, were they talking about it? Did Brian say something like, hey, something bad happened. I need your help. Uh, you know, this is what's going on. I mean, maybe he didn't let him, maybe he didn't tell him everything but maybe he let him in on some things like, Hey, I'm in trouble. I just can't tell you right now, but I'm in trouble, you know, somehow in trouble. So that's a, a very curious thing too. Uh, did Brian's dad know anything? Um, let's see. Keep in mind that not everything evidence wise will be listed in this document. It's just enough to get the judge to sign off on the arrest warrant. And it goes back to why did, uh, Brian, uh, why didn't Brian kill DM? Maybe he didn't see her. Which, and she's the only one that saw him. Maybe he just wanted to get out of the house as quickly as possible. You got to think of this time frame that they're really sliding in here. This is 13 to 15 minutes that this all went down in. It's so hard to believe the physical nature of doing something like this. And that's where I think it's going to be you know, a little challenging for the prosecution to say, uh, to, to prove that he was in uh, that's this specific time and got in and get out of there. Um, and I'm telling you, if they didn't find the sheath with his DNA on it, it would be very hard to prove if they just had the circumstantial evidence. But I think this DNA is going to be the one that completely locks it down. But we're going to have to see that at trial. And then, um, you know, not another thing that's come up is why didn't DM call the police right away? And that's that's been a, a big question out there. Why didn't DM call the police? Well, look, you know, you got a party house. It's lots of weird noises at all hours of the night. And I went on Reddit today and was kind of poking around. I want to kind of bring up some of these questions, uh, some of these answers to maybe in defense of why DM didn't call the police at those specific times. So I had a Reddit user comment says, seems like a lot of people are judging DM's actions, uh, haven't had roommates, at least not social at least not social college age ones. Roommates come in home drunk after a bad night and talk and cry on the phone or to each other. Roommates have invited guests coming in and out of the house at all hours and random dudes slipping in at 4.30 in the morning usually isn't unheard, unheard of in a full house of college age women. Roommates have dogs that bark in the middle of the night for no reason. If you're drunk and exhausted, some combination of these three things isn't going to make you call 911 immediately, especially if they've all happened plenty of times before. And then another comment that I saw that was very interesting as well. They said a hundred percent communal living in a party house is some degree of chaos at all times, especially on drunken weekends, noises, yelling people you don't know are all common places and occurrences. So Again, um, lots of information here from the affidavit. Uh, the next hearing for Brian will be on January 12th. I know that we'll be all looking forward to that. And now we have a lot of information to digest here uh, going forward. You know, some theories. But the biggest one is, what is the connection? What is the connection? Why did he go to this house? What is the connection to the individuals in this house. And hopefully we can find that out. Hopefully we can find the murder weapon. That may be very difficult to do uh, at this time. So it just remains, of course, to be seen. So I want to thank everybody this evening for hanging in with me, reading through the affidavit, listening to my thoughts on this conversation and my thoughts on this case. Uh, I'm going to keep following it here as it's pretty much gripped me and, um, you know, a lot to, a lot to go through now and digest. 
So I appreciate everybody jumping on this evening. Hillbilly, thank you for the comments in the chat. And uh, again, this is the first time over here on the Opinionated Idiot channel. Please like, share, and subscribe. I do these live streams as much as I can. And of course, try to pump out as much uh, material as I can too for all of you. So I appreciate all of the fans so far on this channel. I'm looking to obviously grow this channel as large as I can and uh, and keep doing things like this. So with that being said, my voice is now shot for the evening, but it was has been a lot of fun. Uh, you know, not not fun in the way of the sense of, uh, you know, reading tra tragedy, but it's been uh, but been fun to to reflect on this case and give my opinion. So I uh, appreciate everybody again this evening for hanging out. I'm going to dip out now. And like they say, opinions are like a-holes and everybody's got one. I'll see you next time. Bye, guys. Peace.